On behalf of New Covenant Church, we're so proud of you. We love you, and I am so glad that you are back for six weeks, and we're going to take advantage of that. Uh, everybody, please keep her in your prayers, so into her ministry. It's such good ground, such good ground. And Kennedy, thank you for sharing just a little bit. I'm sure you've got a hundred stories to tell because when you travel, you have lots of stories. You accumulate stories when you travel. And you are always actually traveling, no matter whether you leave town or not. You're on a journey and you're accumulating some stories and hopefully you're learning and you're maturing. And I come back from Montana refreshed and rejuvenated and I've been ducked. Does anybody know what I'm saying when I say I've been ducked? Is there a Jeep owner in the house? So I got ducked while I was renting a Jeep. I rented a Rubicon for a couple weeks. And one day I was pulled over on the side of an 8,000 foot cliff, looking down on a stream, wishing I could get down there and fish. And three or four other Rubicons pull up beside me, and they're admiring the Jeep, and I'm pretending like I own it because it doesn't have any indication of a rental on there. Uh, I wasn't deceptive. I was just, you know, going along with the conversation. And then uh, as I was enjoying the view, and then I came back to the Jeep, there was this duck sitting on a fender. And I've seen these ducks on Jeep dashboards everywhere. And I'm like, what's the deal? I don't understand it and really didn't care to investigate it until now. And I learned that uh, this all started when someone, it was actually someone in Canada, which I was about 22 miles from Canada when this happened, someone placed a duck, a plastic duck like this, on someone else's Jeep after getting into some disagreement, some miscommunication, some, some argument happened. And to make amends and begin the conversation back to health, they placed a duck on their friend's Jeep and left a note with it saying, I hope you have a great day. And that began the road back to a recovered relationship. And I thought, well, that's really cool. Now, I appreciate the ducks when I see them on a Jeep dashboard because they really express joy, forgiveness, love, reconciliation. Man, it sounds like Jesus ducks to me. So now I look at these like Jesus ducks. But I'm going to use my Jesus duck today just every once in a while as we go down the road. I've got some road trip tips for you today. Because while I flew a long ways, I spent a lot of time in that Jeep. I accumulated a lot of miles, and the Lord showed me some things to share with you. And so every time we take a turn on this road, <laughs> remember, joy, forgiveness, reconciliation, Jesus. Okay? All right. So I started out most of my beginning days of my trip fishing. You know I love fishing. And the valley that I was in had a lot of history with the mines, with gold mines, gold rush, okay? And uh, as, as I travel, I love to stop at all the historical markers and read what happened here and there. And in this particular valley that I spent a lot of time fishing, there was a, um, a, the former trail, which later became a railroad, which later became a highway, was frequented by people moving into this area where gold was found. And so it went from a path to a serious roadway. And this roadway also offered opportunity for people to be robbed, taken advantage of, and even murdered. And so these, these um, terrorists, these, these folks that were robbing, these thieves was set up along this route, this corridor, and they were led by the crooked sheriff. And so they had this front, and they, they called themselves the Innocents. Innocents with a T, the Innocents. 
And they would terrorize this corridor, and you would think that they were good guys, but they were really bad guys. Finally, the local citizens, the folks had had enough, and they began a little vigilante committee to take care of business because there was no law established in the 1860s in southwest Montana. Okay, so the vigilantes rose up. And I want to share with you this one thing that I pulled up that uh, I found quite interesting about their oath that they took. This group of about, I think it was about 25, that uh, took this oath as vigilantes to bring justice to the territory. This was their, their little promise, their little oath that they took. It said, join hands and raise them to the Lord Almighty and repeat after me. We, the undersigned, uniting ourselves together for the laudable purpose of arresting thieves and murderers and recovering stolen property, do pledge ourselves on our sacred honor, each to all others, and solemnly swear that we will reveal no secrets, violate no laws of of right, and never desert each other or our standard, our standard of justice." So help us God. Hmm. Why am I bringing this to your attention? Because there are innocents always trying to steal from you. There are people, religion, churches, even faith-based movements that may be disguised as innocent, but they're taking away from the Father heart of God that he's placed in you. Can I get a little more specific? Can I talk to us right here in Haywood County? Before I left, I was made aware of a parade. And a group or several people came to me and said, Pastor, would it be okay if if we showed up at this pride parade? And immediately I said, yes. And immediately I said, you go with the Father heart of God. And if you heard me say that, you can attest to what I said. You go with the Father heart of God. You don't go with religion. You don't go with rules. The law never, never reached anyone's heart. You see, Jesus came and abolished the law because he came in love. Okay? And if you go saying, I'm innocent and waving a Christian flag, you remember what Jesus said to those that waved rules and flags and scrolls? He rebuked the Pharisees and said, you're bringing rules and religion, and that's not the Father heart of God. You'll never reach anybody with a piece of paper. You will reach somebody with a relationship. And if that particular matter of pride doesn't sit well with you, every one of us, including me, needs a parade around our hearts because there's something deceitful and wicked in all of us. And it needs a Jericho march and it needs to be broken down. But it's with the Father heart of God. Will we all be reached with the thing that we hold pridefully? Mm. It's the Father heart of God. That's why it's good. It's the Father, heart of God. And I respect and admire and appreciate those that went. Because, you know, I asked asked the Lord, I said, hey, I said, Jesus, if if you were there, what would you do? And I, I, I like saw him. I didn't hear him say anything, but I just saw him 
And it didn't matter if the persons that he was reaching were in the street, in the parade, on the sidewalk, in the car, wherever they were, he went to reach the lost and tell about the kingdom of God, which is the Father heart of God. Jesus only came to do what the Father said to do. And the only people that Jesus rebuked were the religious. So I, I kind of, I could see Jesus rebuking the religious on Main Street. And I could see Jesus loving the lost. And don't label the lost as those in the parade. Because the lost are sometimes in the church. Okay, that's heavy. <laughs> Forgiveness, reconciliation, Jesus, Jesus. Do not be quick to judge. Matthew 7, 1, can we see that? Judge not that you be not judged. We all have something. I don't care if you're an elder or you just came to faith this week. There's something that doesn't need to be judged by a human. But let the Lord judge your heart. And let what's prideful be broken down. Because the Lord is not about pride, no matter what you're prideful of. All right? Oh, man. Vacation just does something for me. Let's, uh, I, let's move on from innocence to ignorance. So why do I want to talk to you about ignorance? Because I found myself feeling very ignorant on this trip because I take myself as a pretty good fisherman. And I thought I knew what I was doing. And... I know that where I was was like the Mecca for fly fishing for trout. And I, 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 if I can fish these mountain streams and navigate through what we have to navigate here through the laurels and the, the, the overhang and the dog hobble and the small creeks and climbing the mountains, then big sky country is going to be easy and the fish are going to be big. Well... I did something for the first time that I've never done before, and that was I hired a guide. I think I was a little too prideful to hire a guide in the past. But I, I realized that any fish I've ever caught before in territory outside of here was pretty much luck. Because when you hire a guide that dwells there, that lives there, that knows the water, your production, your, uh, your success... It's like a hundredfold. And I learned so much that I didn't know because I was in different water, in a different place, using different techniques. And like the rod they gave me was 10 feet long. 10 feet long, Braden. I've never had a 10 foot long rod, but the technique they showed me produced fish this big. And yes, Kevin, they were this big. Not this big, but this big. But, but listen, when, when, we're, when we're faced with our own ignorance, we realize how much on any journey that we're on, whatever season you're in, wherever you're moving towards, ignorance will limit you. You won't get to where you're wanting to get to with ignorance in your life, and I have it and you have it. We always have to be teachable. We always have to be learning or else we'll be limited. We never arrive in our understanding. I don't care if you count yourself as an expert fisherman. Let me pick you up and put you somewhere else like Chile or Argentina and you won't have a clue what to do. But bring somebody along with you that knows the territory, that knows how to navigate what's different. And your, your limits will be lifted. So in the ignorance, my, what the Lord gave me was get a guide. Get a guide. When you're in uncomfortable territory or when you get comfortable, 
You know, this house is known for, for inner healing ministry. Like we, we really minister to that. We really minister the Father heart of God to be delivered from, from, from some of our obstacles. Amen. And yet the Lord was telling me <laughs> during this trip, this, yes, that is, that is part of your identity at New Covenant Church. But he's challenging me to take it to another level because there's some things that we haven't learned yet. Amen. And we can get arrogant because, oh, we've been doing this for 46 years. We know it. We are the house to come to. Amen. But my God is a big God. And there are things that we have not encountered. There are, there, there is a, we're in a different year, a different, uh, a different culture. There's new devils at new levels. And so there's different levels of deliverance that we need. And we don't know it all. So, so our best guide is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit will speak at whatever level you need a breakthrough. Because he's a guide. He's a comforter. And... Jesus knows it all, and Holy Spirit points to Jesus. So, so the, the ignorance that, that limits us, I asked Jesus, what would you say to that? And he says, be teachable. And if we look at Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, there's something that I missed when I read this verse, and you might have missed it too. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why have I skipped those four words? I just go, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke, Jesus. Praise breaks the heavy yoke. I'm free. Jesus says, I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Why did I skip and learn from me? His word is living, and it's, it's active, and it's ongoing through generations. And so I believe he's saying to us, to this house, there's still more to learn from me. Don't stop being who you're being in offering deliverance ministries. Go to the next level. There's more. What people needed delivering of a generation ago is still valid. But now there are new and more complicated, maybe more complex for all the generations to be delivered of something for our freedom's sake. Innocence, ignorance. I love me some I words today. Let's look at intersections. Intersections. So back to my Rubicon, back to the Jeep. Man, I put so many miles on that thing. And most places I went had no service. How many of you, even now, like working around your local area, navigating our local roads, you're, you're using your GPS to go to places you've been going to for years. What's the fastest way for me to get to Ingalls? <laughs> but you go there every week. But there might be a road construction. There might be a bridge out. There might be whatever. So I'm going to just lean in on my GPS today to save a minute. Yeah, I'm guilty of that too. So I had to download maps on my phone that I could use offline. And there's some really great apps for that if you're into hunting and fishing that will help you find streams and trails and so on. So I had done this in anticipation of this because I had someone tell me that before I got there. And so every intersection, you've got a choice to make. And the path may look good one way, but that's not the way you're supposed to go. And you look left or right at the trail that you really need to go on. And you see how rough and rutted out and muddy and rocky it is. And you say, I'm not supposed to go that way, am I? And you pull it up on the map. Yes, I am. So one in particular intersection, the road I needed to turn on, I was at 9,500 feet. And I needed to turn right to go down and get back into the valley I had come up from, 3,000 feet below. 6,500 feet is where I started. And the sign said two words, primitive road. <laughs> That's all I said, primitive road. I was like, oh, man. And it just didn't even look like a road. 
But I saw some tracks. They were probably Jeep tracks. So every time we came to these intersections that looked a little challenging, I had this duck on the dash, and I'd look at who was with us, and I'd go, here we go. Let's do it. Let's do it. And we would put in the four-wheel low and head down. And this particular intersection took us down this road called Cottonwood Road. And we went through places I would probably not go again. <laughs> we got deep and we got up on rocks and just like at one point I was singing a hymn. And it was like, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. And like we would hit a rock and my voice would go up and then we'd hit a, we'd go through the water. But every time we got a little scared, I just grabbed that duck and say, we got this. We got this. What am I trying to tell you in the intersections of your journey right now? Somebody here is going through a section where there's an intersection. And you've got to make a turn. And I don't know about you ladies, but guys, we just don't like to go back the way we came. Am I right? You never go backtracking the way you came. But sometimes that turn just looks like something you don't want to go down. But it's getting you to where the Lord wants to take you. And when you come to these intersections, don't be in a rush. Ask the Holy Spirit. Check your offline map. That's kind of what he is. Like he is always with you. And he will guide you. He will navigate you. Take usually the road less traveled. Take the challenging road. Take the one that's going to require you to maybe get down in four low. Because the rewards, the learning, the, the levels of, of innocence go away because you have experience. I, I love to be around people that have experience and hard things because I can learn from them. And I can also be inspired from them. If you're at an intersection, just encouraging you, consider the hard road. Maybe consider the low road, but sometimes it's the high road. You'll know. Ask the Lord. I encourage you to ask him first, not a person. Ask the person of the Holy Spirit. And take your time on that. I asked my, my friend that was out there that let me stay. I said, uh, I was telling him about this crazy road we were on. I said, uh, what what would we have done if we had broke down? Uh, what, I mean, I didn't have any service. And he just quickly looked at me and he said, well, what would it have hurt you if you just had to spend the night? He said, what would it have hurt you if you had to walk seven miles down to the bottom of the valley? What would it have hurt you to be prepared for a hard time? Not the easy time. I was like, well, you know, that's a great perspective. Why do we avoid the difficult? Why do we avoid the long way when sometimes it's the best way? And then you learn. And then you see how you can trust God through a hard thing. So I appreciated what he had to share with me about that. Matthew 7, 14. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So I always look at this verse as this is the description of the road to heaven. It's narrow, few find it. But I've skipped a few words there, never really pondered on the way is hard that leads to life. The most life that comes out of you is often in the hardest things that you've gone through. Amen. 
Because if you've gone through the hard things, then you have life to speak over somebody else that's getting ready to go down that same road. The way is hard that leads to life. And all of us are going to face some intersections. Intersections try to detour you from what's best. Sometimes pick the hard way. Lastly, interruptions. So innocence, ignorance, intersections, interruptions. How many of you have had an interruption just this year? Something has surprised you in your life that you didn't expect, that's kind of interrupted your plan, that's kind of interrupted the direction you thought you were going, interrupted you on the way to a destination you had planned. Interruptions are inevitable. They're inevitable. But interruptions test your character. Interruptions allow your faith to rise. Interruptions give space for testimonies. I've had a lot of interruptions the last two weeks. My first interruption was missing my connector flight and spending a day in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Listen, I love Eugene, but I'd rather be in Missoula, Montana than Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is me personally. But you got to make the best of it. I didn't plan that. That was an interruption. That's not what I wanted. But let me tell you, church, every day has an interruption. Interruption shouldn't cause us to be sour, complaining, negative. If I had been traveling with some negative people, Minneapolis would have become uh, not a good place. <laughs> but listen, when, you're, when your heart is always hopeful, when praise is breaking the heavy yoke, when we sing, I've got miles and miles of mercy behind me, when I've got the goodness of God in my life, then I can take a hard road. I can make a wrong turn at an intersection. I can absorb an interruption and still have joy in my life. I need a house of joy to go on and on through New Covenant Church. We need to be countercultural. We need to be at the parades we need to, that we feel led to be at. But we need to bring the joy of the Lord, the heart of the Father, and not the rules and the religion and the negativity and the complaints and this place is going to heck in a handbasket. What, what, what are you bringing to that situation that gives life? Where do I read of Jesus complaining? I read of Jesus rebuking the religious and the sinful, but he gives hope and he brings healing. And it's very personal. And it's usually with a physical touch. That's my Jesus. I love interruptions now. Jesus taught me a lot about absorbing interruptions. When I thought my flight was leaving Atlanta last night at 10 and it got moved to 11, I started getting a little grumpy. And then when it moved from 11 to 1 a.m., I started getting a little irritable. And then I thought, what is this interruption for? I can work around this. I can rent a car and be back here before the plane even gets here. And that's what I did. Pulling in at 2.30 a.m. this morning and saying, man, if I just keep it positive and if I keep the others with me positive, it makes the path a pleasure. I'm just encouraging you today to take that frown off. Put a smile on. Look at the bright spots 
Every intersection is an opportunity. Every level of ignorance is an opportunity to learn. Every time you think you're innocent and going to go change a life, don't forget the pride that God's trying to break down in your heart. You know, when, when we think we've, we've arrived, when we get to our destination, whether it's Asheville or Missoula, I hope that us as believers, we're, our destination is to be more like Jesus, is to go further into the kingdom life. And I know you've, you've read this or heard Jesus' teaching about the eye of the camel, and you think that's always about wealth and riches and possessions. Well, I want to expand your thinking on that because the eye of the needle or the hole in the needle is an opening in the wall of an ancient city. Jesus, why did you use this story? Why, why did you say it's harder for a rich man to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a, a camel to pass through the eye of the needle and enter the kingdom of God? Why'd you say that? That's, that's so wild. That's crazy. I mean, are you really trying to make a point that it's just really hard? Like, we'll never make it into the kingdom of heaven because it's just too, too small, it's too narrow. How do, I, how do I make it through? What's the way? But then when I realized in Jesus' day in a walled city, when the gates were closed, there would be an opening still available for a traveler that came in late after the gates were closed. We gotta protect the city, but if you come late, we've got this little tiny entryway over here. It keeps the city safe. We're watching that little hole, that little eye of the needle though, but you can come in. And when you travel, you're traveling with a camel. Oh my goodness, how do you, ah, I'm starting to see a picture here. So at the end of the journey, at the destination, if I wanna get in and my camel with me, I got to take off the load. I got to unstrap the saddle. I got to get off what I've been riding. And I got to kneel down at my camel too to get in to the next level of the heart of the Father, to get in to the deeper level of the kingdom, to get into whatever your next destination is. It's oftentimes to, to get low, take off the load, take off the yoke. Jesus said, my yoke is light. Take off what you're carrying. Get down low and enter in. These are just some of the road trip tips that I've learned the last two weeks that I wanted to share with you. Now, I don't know where you are on your journey, what's happening in your life this week, what intersection you're facing, what thing is confusing or puzzling to you that you're trying to figure out because you've not been there before. But the Holy Spirit will lead you. He will guide you. And oftentimes the first step is just to take off the load. Give it to Him and get low. Enter in. He'll share with you what you need to know. Sometimes you don't need to see all the way. It's just that next step. It's just that next step. Can our prayer ministers come forward and we stand at this time? I, I want the Lord to minister to those that are stuck along the way, detoured along the way. Find yourself in a place that you don't normally find yourself in. You're confused. Maybe you're hurt. Maybe you're wounded. Maybe you just don't know which way to turn. The Lord doesn't want you stuck. He doesn't want you lost. The greatest intersection I know, we're going to have to give some vitamins to our prayer ministers, man. They just like, come, come on, come on. Maybe it's because I've had four cups of coffee. <laughs> but I'd be just like running up here because 
Because the Lord has the answers for you. He sees where you're at. Be encouraged. And don't think that you're alone. Somebody's been the way you've already been. And if it's not someone that's ministering to you today, the Lord knows. Let him minister to you. God, I thank you for road trips. I thank you for traveling. I thank you for adventures. I thank you that you show me today that everybody here is on a journey. And we've got obstacles. We've got high roads and low roads. We've got walls to go over and sometimes go through. And God, we need your encouragement. We need your instruction. We need a little direction from time to time, God. I pray today that you would, you would show us the way, that you would minister to where we're at today. And God, I do pray for those that, that are bold enough that, that see a situation or a place that they need to be, that they feel compelled to go to and minister the gospel, minister the good news. God, would you remind them that to go sent and blessed from this house is to go with the heart of the Father. And God, remind them that the greatest intersection of all time is where your son was on the cross. The greatest crossroads of humanity was when your son Jesus spilled his blood for our sins and forgave us if we would believe that he is the son of God and we would repent of our sins and trust in him and, and surrender our lives to him. That's the greatest intersection we could ever cross through. God, I pray today would be the day that someone would move through that very intersection and begin a new life in Christ. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you come and get ministry today? Receive it in your spot or receive it with someone here that's willing to pray with you. God's love is abundant today.